We'll call the meeting to order. This is the November 20th meeting of the Yellow Springs Village Council. Uh, we actually um, just came in from executive session, so we have called the roll. And you will notice that uh, council members Hempling and um, McQueen are not here tonight. Um, everyone else is present, the other three of us are. Um, so announcements, we'll start with announcements. Um, I'll go to Brian first. There's a lot going on this weekend that I'll talk about, but I'll start with Brian. Yeah, I just want to mention a few things. Um, first of all, uh, I wanted to highlight the community Thanksgiving celebration that uh, happens annually at the Presbyterian Church. Uh, everyone is welcome. I will be making a turkey, so make sure to uh, find mine. Uh, it'll be nice and juicy. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that the Yellow Springs Arts Council's uh, Holiday Art Jumble uh, opened last Friday, and so you can go Wednesday through Sunday from 1 to 4. Great gift giving, and it supports our local artists. And um, the last thing that I wanted to highlight was uh, November 28th, which is the Tuesday following Thanksgiving, is a... Uh, dubbed Giving Tuesday and once again the community will be uh, the nonprofits are joining together uh, to do a lot of various uh, accepting of donations so take a look um, it's a really great opportunity to support our local nonprofits Jerry uh, yes uh, as some of some of us have been able to get more rest and so forth I think we all notice now that the time has jumped back and it's getting darker now in the evenings and and we do have quite a few students that participate in fall activity that are when they go to school it's light but after their practice and so forth it's it's getting dark and they will be riding their bikes back home mm -hmm. so i just want to stress on the community to especially on west south college to slow down and be on the lookout for our kids as they they come home in the evenings on on their bikes in or walking. On that note, um, do we still have bike lights, Judy? So we still have bike lights that Judy and the PD are distributing, and um, local resident Carlos Landerboro has been distributing actual flashlights that you can carry in your hand, um, and he's got signs all over town with his contact information, um, but it's Carlos's. Computer. So, if you want to go, if you want to find him in the Red Book, call Carlos, and he can get you a, a flashlight. It's a really good program that he's doing, and he's actually every Saturday he's in front of Dark Star from 11 to 12. So this weekend, so uh, Brian mentioned Thanksgiving, which uh, we're all excited about. Then the next day, November 24th, we call Yellow Friday because. It just can't be black here, and we don't have major sales, and we don't open our stores at 4 o'clock in the morning or something. So, you know, it's a normal shopping day in Yellow Springs on Yellow Friday, um, but it's always fun. It'll start at 10 o'clock with the Bulldog Jog and Fun Run over at Mills Lawn. So you can either do a 5K or you can do um, a little run around the school. So that's always fun. Obviously, shopping in all of our shops. We have carriage rides, um, horse-drawn wagon rides from 2 to 5. That will start in front of the Little Art Theater. And then, obviously, all evening, um, the restaurants and, and pubs and eateries will be open. And then Saturday is Small Business Saturday. So again, it's a time where we focus on shopping local and shopping small and supporting our local businesses. And um, so please do that. Please do your holiday shopping here in Yellow Springs. And I have an announcement. Um, as council is aware, and I think probably a lot of citizens are aware now, Jason Hamby um, did resign his position with the village. Um, he did this shortly before the last council meeting, and Jason's last day was last Friday. Um, I looked back through some records today, and Jason uh, started with the village in 1995 as a seasonal employee. Wow. And so um, he has decided to, um, to go and, and take on some other endeavors, and we wish him well. And uh, he was a valued employee, and he will be missed. Yes. Thanks, Patty. Mm -hmm. uh, any, any other announcements? Um, 
So we're not going to do the consent agenda because we just got the minutes, so we'll defer the minutes for November 6th to the uh, November 18th meeting. Um, petitions or the review of the agenda, is there anything we need to add or remove from the agenda? It is a light agenda tonight since we do have two council members missing. Anything we need to change on the agenda, Brian, Jerry? Okay. Mm, I don't think so. Um, Brian, would you review the petitions and communications? Yeah, so we have three things. So uh, Green County Public Health uh, highlighted that uh, this week until Wednesday is the uh, annual seatbelt <laughs> challenge. So we are hoping that our Yellow Springs high school students uh, do better than they did the last time, uh, looking for 100% seatbelt usage. Um, Rachel McKinley, our uh, village treasurer, submitted a fact sheet about the STAR Ohio program, which stands for, uh, what is it, State Treasury Asset Resource, yes, um, which gives us a better return on our um, deposits. And uh, we also got a, a letter and uh, several documents from Judith Hempfling about the um, study that's been referred to uh, that Wright State University was commissioned to do related to um, uh, uh, stops, traffic stops, and uh, I assume that we'll probably be talking about that at a later date. Okay. And because of the fact that it was it was uh, the subject of discussion at the last meeting, because there was some concern over some of the information being released, um, we um, we wanted to get the full report out as quickly as we could. So that's why the documents are in the packet without discussion. But as Brian said, we will be discussing that at the next meeting um, yes. on November December or, excuse me, 4th. December fourth. Um, okay. Um, so moving into public hearings and legislation, first we have Ordinance 2017-33. Let's read that in by um, title only. Yes, this is repealing Section 1258.01 district uses and Section 1262.08 specific requirements of the codified ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new Section 1258.01 district uses and new Section 1262.08 specific requirements. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay. Denise, hi. Hi. This is removing uh, short-term rental units as a conditional use uh, in the, uh, the district table of uses and adding transient guest lodging as a permitted use in this district schedule. It also is removing short-term rentals in 12-6208 in the conditional use section of the zoning code. Um, and it does not, it will not, transit guest lodging will not appear in this section at this time because it is being considered a permitted use for that. Okay. Any comments or questions, council members? Um, this is a second reading and I will open the public hearing for public comment and questions. Seeing and hearing none, I'll bring it back to council table. Um, Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes. Sims? Yes. Housh? Yes. Wintro? Yes. Uh, I would like to take a minute to thank Denise for all of the hard work that she has done on this transient guest lodging. She and Melissa both have uh, worked really hard on this, and I just want to acknowledge and appreciate the work they've done. That's great. <laughs> it's absolutely, it's been, it's been a long discussion. Mm -hmm. Um, next is Ordinance 2017-41. This is approving the 2018 annual appropriations and declaring an emergency in the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay, Melissa. Okay, so this is the second reading um, of this ordinance. The, uh, there was one change from the uh, original ordinance in the first reading, and that was a reduction in the amount of $20,000 from the uh, public safety total line um, it, that came out of uh, personnel services. Or I'm sorry, um, it, it did not come out of personnel services. It just came out of the public safety total, and therefore it reduced the total general fund appropriations by twenty thousand dollars, and then it also decreased the grand total appropriations uh, by twenty thousand dollars. So the new total um, for the total general fund appropriations is three million two hundred ninety-three thousand ninety-two dollars, 
and the grand total appropriations for all funds is ten million five hundred forty three thousand five hundred and sixty six and I had also given a, uh, a brief PowerPoint presentation on uh, revenues and expenditures from the general fund and um, the enterprise funds and that presentation was in the packet for uh, council and for the public to review great very nice so that's it for me, unless anybody has questions. Well, I guess uh, we probably should highlight some of those items that are uh, noted as, as 0% or are, are a little bit more than 0%, but I guess much less than 1, right? Oh, from the... Um, the I, I saw a couple of the charts just... Uh, yeah, the general fund expenditures. We have some very, very small departments. Um, mediation is a $7,500 budget, so it doesn't even show up as registering um, because the overall general fund is um, over $3 million. So that's such a small amount that it doesn't even equal out to 1%. So those, if I would have probably expanded those percentages out a few decimal points, um, <laughs> right. some of those smaller departments would have registered. But right. they do have budgets and they are listed out, but they you know, were too small to register as a whole percent. Sure. And I, I guess I, this is a good time for me to emphasize that uh, the amount of I, I, of spending that we do on um, you know things like commissions is also less than one percent. Um, I think it's really important work uh, that our commissions do, but it, it is a very small amount. And Melissa, could you just briefly review, maybe do a little bit of a comparison with with 2016 uh, or excuse me 2017, um, because we're the budget is looking strong. Would you can. Yes. Our, our revenues are strong, um, came in a little bit higher than expected. Yes, um, the revenues were approximately $700,000 more, and I'm going completely by memory. I don't have the full expanded version in front of me this evening, but um, the revenues for 2017 were approximately $700,000 ahead, and part of that was, um, well, the bulk of that was from income tax increases, and then the sale of Sutton Farm did come into that, uh, into play there which was, I believe, $260,000, and then the rest of that was income tax as far as the general fund is concerned. Mm -hmm. um, but with the 2018 budget, I did, um, I did receive in the mail uh, this week and last week, we do have portions of the water plant payment, so it wasn't included in this budget, and they're not full payments, but I will have to do a supplemental appropriation um, for a partial payment that it will be deducted December 29th um, this year for the water plant. So. Okay. Um, that will have to change with the 2018 budget as well. So they came way too late in the in the year for me to be able to take into consideration for the 2018 budget. Okay, and and the, the expenditures are no no extraordinary other than than the payments for the water plan. No, no, no extraordinary, and we're keeping. Um, very close to what we were. Yes, and last we've, we've year. paid quite a bit of debt down to across some of the funds, so um, that's a, that's also a good thing. So, yeah, it's the the budget is the best it's been since I've been here. And so. money going into capital funds yes. and things. So yes. it's a very very good budget, very positive, which is always nice to see. Um, I will open the public hearing. Did I already open the public hearing? I don't think I did. I, think didn't. I will open the public hearing for comments or questions from citizens. Seeing and hearing none, I'll bring it back to council table. Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes. Housh. Yes. Sims. Yes. Winter. Yes. And again, it's the end of a another long budget road, and I want to um, thank Melissa for all the work she's done because the budget is usually really difficult and time consuming for her, and she always does an amazing job on it. Well, thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Resolution 2017-49. <laughs> this is awarding a bid for construction of new crew quarters for all public works, electric, water distribution, and sewer collection employees on the property known as the Sutton Farm to Overer Thompson Company. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Um, is Johnny going to do the presentation? Great. Um, yeah, I would just like to preface this by saying, um, if council remembers, we did have a, an inspection by um, Ohio Bureau of Workers' Compensation. They performed a safety inspection at Sutton Farm um, earlier in the year, and um, they found several issues, which um, I think Judy's getting ready to show some pictures um, of the different issues that they found, some safety 
um, issues and uh, other health issues. So council had agreed that um, we would look into taking the design that was done several years ago for Sutton Farm and um, having that um, updated and putting it out to bid. And this is the culmination of um, that entire process that we've been working on all year. So, Johnny? Evidently, so you don't have the old pictures. Yeah. We, didn't put, we didn't put old ones up, we okay. just put your new ones. The old ones are in the packet. Yeah. The, the old building that you are looking at that has the crew sitting in it, I see with Karen, mm -hmm. uh, that's about 160 square foot that feeds. We all, there's not of us that eat lunch in there every day uh, with the table, refrigerator, microwave. Um, the restroom and locker room is about another 300 square foot. And then one side that we've actually moved out of is because of the condition of it, it's roughly about 140 square foot. So total, it's uh, 600 square foot. Um, when it rains, the water comes under the walls and goes to the nearest drain, which is in the locker room, so it passes all the way through. So we have come up with several different plans. This is the most economic. Uh, and it is by tearing the old one off and build a new one right on the existing. Uh, it does a couple of things. We're able to reuse the uh, sanitation, the leach field, uh, by being able to attach right to that. The new crew quarters will be, we're gonna leave the existing locker room just completely updated. The old bathroom will become the mechanical room uh, and it will get a new electric furnace, uh, new electric, uh, water heater and the existing, we just had a new well system put in. So that will all be updated, rotated. They will also have a washer and dryer, which we do not have now. Uh, if we get mud, sewage, dirt, we take it home. And that was one of the things that the Bureau of Workers Comp said that's not to happen. EPA will take it the same thing. We're supposed to live in the village where we found it. Um, so by leaving those two rooms on, it gives us about another thousand square foot that we're going to add on to it. Uh, the men's restroom will be a slash locker room. We'll have two showers, one stall and a urinal with 11 lockers to accommodate for the shower situation. And then we included a women's locker room. We'll have one shower, one stall, and three lockers in case we uh, have a female in the future. So what's the, what does, is the old locker room going to be? The old locker room will be the, it will still be the, the locker room. Okay. Uh, we're just going to put a bench in the middle so we can sit down and put our boots on and stuff. But then you'll have a separate locker room in the shower area for your other clothes. So um, this right here shows the actual um, top left hand side is the old restrooms. It's being turned into the mechanical area. The right is where the uh, lockers are going to be, and you, you can see where you come straight through. You got a little table there. That's a much, a much larger area. It's probably uh, 750 square foot area where you can have training, you can have your lunch area, and uh, can you zoom out. on the floor plan itself? Yes. It's also, uh, instead of just regular concrete, we also did uh, ceramic tile on the floor with the uh, code base to go up to where we get it cleaned up, get mud in there, you'd be able to clean it all down. Uh, there's going to be a new concrete pad out front to where we can have a picnic table sit on the concrete. So if you don't want to eat inside during the summertime, you can actually have a little picnic table outside to eat on. Uh, vinyl siding and new windows, new AC unit, uh, and then the new kitchen area. Now the price does not include the appliances. We're just going to take that out of the budget later. I know somebody that might be able to help you with that. <laughs> uh, I, I'd like to, I know that probably a question that a lot of people would have with this design is why do you need washers and dryers and showers? And as Johnny pointed out, there are any number of chemicals that both of our crews, um, well, all three of our crews could get into in the course of a day. And they, the, the EPA does not want them taking chemicals, raw sewage, et cetera, home to their, to their families. And um, so this has long been 
um, a, require, a suggestion is becoming a requirement that these facilities are provided for, for workers in case they are exposed to, um, to any of these things that, so they don't take this home to their families and potentially spread some type of disease or illness that, that they get exposed to. These are, the, our employees have the proper vaccinations and, and things for this. Um, but their families don't necessarily well, have those things. I personally don't think it needs a lot. When you say sewage <laughs> and home, I don't think you need to explain much more than that. And did we do have a washer and dryer already, or that's no, what, yeah. that's part of the. Once the uh, building is built, then we will pick out a washer and dryer. Yeah, and take that out of the regular. Okay. And, and we do have a Sam's card, and Sam sells washers and dryers and things. And but so it, it's a commercial. I mean, it seems like it should be a little bit commercially it's rated. Commercial. Okay, it's good. Okay. Yeah. So, Johnny, do you have anything else? Mm -hmm. Yes, it has. I mean, I well, I can tell you, I I took off this whole building. I measured this entire building, but 10 years ago or 15 years ago, when we were going to just remodel the interior, and it looks surprisingly much worse than it did that long ago. So it's really horrible. I mean, it was bad then. I'm, you know, I feel really bad that you guys had to live with this for so long well, so and, and council did say that you know along with the the sale of part of State <coughs> farm that my request was part of that go back into um, making it possible to have these crew quarters um, redone and so i just appreciate the council was willing to let us go through this process and get these new crew quarters any questions or comments council questions or comments from citizens Seeing and hearing none, we will, um, I go, oh, this is a resolution. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you, Johnny. Thanks, Johnny. And Judy, let's read this next one in, in full. Surely. This is declaring November 25th, 2017, Mayor Fobert Day in the village of Yellow Springs. Whereas David Fobert has served the village of Yellow Springs as its mayor for 26 years, and whereas in those 26 years, mayor's court has been held 624 times, 312 couples have been married, and 126 proclamations have been delivered. And whereas Mayor Fobert has attended myriad village events to which he has contributed his support, his wit, and his genuine passion for his village and its diverse and many splendored people. And whereas Mayor Fobert has left a lasting impression on this small village that we today wish to acknowledge, now therefore be it resolved that Section 1, November 25th, 2017, shall be recognized as Mayor Fobert Day in the village of Yellow Springs and is intended as a day of celebration and joy. Thank you. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. And just. I had talked about the uh, the events that that uh, November 25th is Small Business Saturday, and even though we're not talking about business here with Mayor Fobert, just the whole focus on local and small town, it seemed um, as appropriate a day as any to to celebrate. Um, all the service he's given to the village, we will miss him. And I can't believe we had our we had the uh, celebration for him last week, and nobody mentioned when he was mayor for um, the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> so he was he that was he gave that performance. I think he quite enjoyed it. He was probably a little taller than he should have been, <laughs> but um, otherwise he uh, he that that was one, I think one of the highlights of his career. Um, so we will definitely miss Mayor Fobert, um, but we do welcome um, Pam Kanine, who is our new mayor, will be our new mayor as of January 1st at midnight, or 12.01, I think I would, I would say. I know that well. <laughs> Any other comments? It was a great celebration. It was. And, thank, uh, thanks, you know, staff, for yeah, putting that together. Yeah, the cake was great. <laughs> Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Yeah, I like picture cakes. <laughs> it was a good picture of the mayor. Thank you to the news for uh, sending that over because that was the picture from the news that was on the cake. Oh, nice. Uh, now is the time in the agenda where we hear comments from citizens who um, about items that are not on the agenda. Um, we ask you to come up to the microphone, uh, state your name, and uh, keep your comments to three minutes. Al? Um, I'm Al Schleter. I'm, I'm a member of the 
Justices and Task Force. <clears throat> I'm sorry I wasn't able to be here at the last meeting, uh, but I did watch the video, at least the pertinent points, and I just felt the need to be, come here and briefly share my, my uh, view. Uh, I'd like the council to know that I voted with David Turner and the majority of, of the committee uh, to not send the report to you until it was put into a proper form. Um, uh, I, I did not do this to, to protect the police department. I, I have, I've had serious uh, concerns about the police for, for many years, but uh, I was felt that we wanted to do this properly. Uh, it, I think it's, it's very unfortunate that David was singled out in the post because it was a committee action, uh, not his individual action. Uh, I think you've got the, the report. Um, I'm not really happy about it. Uh, John has graciously given me the, the um, spreadsheet of all the data. He worked very hard on it, and it was an important effort. And I'm, I'm trying to do an analysis of it that I think will be more useful than just putting a number out based on a, a seven-year period. So, uh, for example, I'm trying to determine if the racial disparities in citations has improved or gotten worse uh, over a time period. Uh, uh, and I'm trying to determine if the statistics are skewed by maybe one or two police officers that are no longer with the staff uh, being outliers in, the, in their uh, giving citations. I think if we, if we have a a better analysis, it'll be more valuable to the chief and to, the, to you to, to uh, interpret the data. Uh, I, just, it, I just really uh, think of the way it's done is not, uh, uh, is not very useful. Uh, it's unfortunate that the task force, which has worked so well, has been uh, put in disarray by the actions of one member. We spent two and a half hours trying to do mediation at our last meeting. Uh, last uh, Tuesday, and it, I can't, don't feel we made much progress. David Turner asked, asked me not to, uh, not to say anything really um, uh, aggressive because he he really wants to do one-on-one -on -one, um, uh, reconciliation to try to get a result between the two individuals. I think if they can work it out then the committee can maybe uh, proceed. So I just want to share my views. Thank you, Al. Thanks, Al. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay. Well, go into old business. Um, <coughs> timeline for boards and commissions. Um, is this something that you worked on? Uh, yeah, but I think um, I'll okay. let Judy okay. start. Oh. This. Well, Brian and I met about this just to sort of uh, go over what had been discussed in the last council meeting and see if there were areas here that, that things could be firmed up a little bit. So I provided you with an updated guideline for commissions, committees, boards, um, kind of thing that uh, sort of based on conversation between myself and Brian and then based on that last conversation in council meeting. Um, uh, and I did speak about just having setups for interviews run through the clerk just to streamline that process and make sure that the follow-up is smooth and things are done in a timely fashion and I'm absolutely fine with that. I think that's just a matter of council finding that agreeable as well. Um, one thing that I had really um, wanted to have added and, and Brian was in agreement with it was that all interviews follow um, EEOC guidelines. At present there's no there, there really aren't any guidelines for those interviews, and I think that's an important one to add. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, I will just add to that, um, you know, a couple things that I thought were important is, you know, we do have past uh, legislation that highlights that when we do nominations, we should be highlighting the merits of the candidates. Um, which I guess I would like to see us do moving forward, so that that is on the record what our what our decisions are based on, and um, 
I mean, I, I think otherwise, um, the other piece of this is Marianne and I will be talking about some of the uh, updates to the ordinances uh, in particular. I think we, uh, Karen had asked that the treasurer um, position be removed, so we'll do uh, make some recommendations like that, and those will be coming to the uh, December 4th meeting. Um, but otherwise, I, I like the things that Judy has added. One other thing that I'm thinking about doing is kind of a, a best practices one pager for commission members and uh, council members as well, just to highlight, kind of pull out some of these main things like uh, getting the agenda out uh, as soon as possible so that we can put that on the website and on Facebook so that citizens know what's going to be discussed at, count, at commission meetings. Um, also getting those minutes in, uh, you know, ASAP. And uh, the other thing I had noted was, what do I have here? Um, oh, making sure that we, any changes to meeting times are also noted right away so that we can put that out there. Um, so I think this is a great start. Um, the last thing is Judy and I had kind of looked at an overall timeline that I think we'll try to put together for December 4th as well uh, that just lets people know once they submit uh, an application when they should expect to hear. But I do think the idea of Judy um, doing the interviews and scheduling those makes a lot of sense across the board. It'll be, you know, on the record, we you know can then make sure that we're doing that in a timely manner. And you you had also Brian, I forgot to bring it up, spoken about Karen had brought up the notion that the roles and responsibilities mm, yes. uh, sheet is a little too general, a little too broad, and we talked about uh, making that a mo more directed and coherent document. And I'm I'm not sure if that's what you were referring to with your work with Marianne. If that's uh, what you Address, but. Yeah, I'm glad you highlighted that in particular. So I agree. The uh, you know the behaviors for elected officials, the you know hundred or so items. I think we should pare that down to something more focused. So I thought that was a great recommendation. And I also wonder if you know you're talking that a one pager. I mean, it maybe is there a way to perhaps consolidate some of this to maybe one full page I mean I you know I mean I feel like there's a lot we're kind of inundated we're going from kind of nothing for the commissions to all of a sudden we're just kind of inundating them plus um, they do have the the sunshine law training that they need to take so I mean I'm just I guess my suggestion would be if you could consolidate maybe consolidate a little bit and and I mean I think I think if you're looking at that roles and responsibilities documents some of that Really, it is about best practices um, yeah. and could potentially be folded together. That could be. I guess the document I'm thinking about, though, but I, I, I think that's a good point, um, is really more reminders mm -hmm. of get those minutes to Judy, you know, get that agenda, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, but I, I think that's a good point. And so Mary Ann are gonna, and I are going to meet next week and we'll look at it holistically. Okay, sounds good. Well, and we also <clears throat> added, and that, you know, it's certainly for your consideration in light of the recent uh, kind of issues with JSTF, was it under implementing directives and initiating projects? I think it, my um, understanding is that council's intent when, when assigning a project, for example, just to Energy Board, can you bring us back information on this subject, is that that will be publicly presented to council before it's disseminated in any other kind of an arena. And so we added that, and you can just certainly weigh in on mm -hmm. that, but that's, that's there as well. Mm -hmm. And Judy, while I'm thinking about it, on one thing I just noticed yesterday was on the uh, the second document um, that's got the different bullet points. Yeah. I guess just making the third bullet point clear that that I guess you're going to follow up with candidates because um, it, it right now it reads the council rep, but just so that it's, it's consistent mm -hmm. with the other ones. Ah, oh, gotcha. Yep. yep. Chris, can I ask you a question about public record? So Judy's, the comment that Judy just made about things going to coming to council before being disseminated publicly, 
and the comment that the the point that was made I think by Lori Asplin last week in, in a letter to council or the last meeting that that the report that um, was done for the JSTF was a public document immediately it, it is is that true the the context of drafts um, can be complicated. I mean, it, you know, the body is, was convened and they were working on a document that would be endorsed by the committee that would have its recommendations or the information that it would intended to present to council. And I think that we see that in the packet tonight. Um, the records retention schedule and, and what's defined as a public record um, does not necessarily include the keeping of a draft because a draft does not reflect the official action of the public body. Um, so I think that it really depends on does that draft reflect something that you want it to show. So if there are meeting minutes that are being made as part of the official acts of that committee, that would reflect the discussion that's been contemplated in the draft. So I think that um, in that sense, I don't think that a draft necessarily becomes a public record automatically by virtue of the fact that it's a draft. Okay. That's that's good. No, that's no, I think that's really clear. I mean it does seem it does seem as if there's gotta be some kind of um, different I mean some kind of I don't want I don't want to say wiggle room, but there there is some dif difference. There's certainly a difference between a document that comes to council ha having been prepared and basically work product. Okay, thank you. Um, so are we done with this? So so we this will be on our agenda again on the next meeting? Yes. Okay. Um, moving on to the updating nominating petition discussion. Um, Brian, I think that that's really been something that you've been um, working on, and I know we've got a lot of documents in our packet, and I think that there are some at the table, so. Yeah, so I, I'll just begin by saying, um, you know, this was something that uh, we had talked about um, during the last election cycle, and uh, we were reminded again that we needed to update our nominating petition document. Um, I discovered when I ran again for council this time that uh, Yellow Springs is is unique in Greene County in having its own document, which. Uh, not only is it hard to read because it's so old and they can't make good copies of it, but also it uh, had things like you know needing to get it notarized and, and things that are not requirements uh, uh, according to state law and the ORC. Um, the other piece of that was I was handed an instruction document that um, didn't relate to our document, so um, even for me, who had done this three times, it was a bit confusing. So we decided uh, that we should look at um, standardizing our document along with uh, everybody else in the county, and um, I think I will turn it to Judy, because Judy has done some work on that, uh, and then I can follow up with any other comments. Yeah, so we started off by cleaning up that cleaning up the document and making it clearer and easier to read, streamlining a few areas of it. Um, and then the initial nominating petition that was in your packet was given to Brian by the Board of Elections as, well, this is the standard document. If, if you'd like to go to the ORC sanctioned document, this is it. I uh, emailed Lynn McCoy today to just clarify and see if I could get an instruction sheet. And she said, oh, you've got the wrong thing. <laughs> so. What's at your table right now is, in fact, the correct nominating position, so, petition for... So the first two pages, or first three pages, are what we're using now? In the Of the, the original, packet. yes. Of your original okay. thing that was in the packet, yes. Okay. So, because what was given to Brian was the partisan nominating position, petition. This is the non-partisan nominating petition, which asks for no... Um, political affiliations does not require them so okay. that's clearly where we wanted wanted to go with that and they are in fact working on a new updated instruction sheet Brian and I had the conversation about um, we have we have home rule we are charter communities so there are a few things that we would want to let folks know 
these are requirements of you in order to be able to run. They're very basic. That we could create a very simple instruction sheet that says, these are the requirements as far as the Village of Yellow Springs goes. Now go here and pick up your following petition and instruction form uh, to make it a much clearer much clearer process. But I thought, I, I thought part of the point of this was that there wouldn't be any difference. Well, there may or may not be, but for example, we require that you be, you, you, cannot, have, yeah. you cannot have been the president, you cannot have been a village manager within X amount of time. There are a few little particulars to charter. charter. But they're not, I mean, they're going to happen to someone once in a blue moon, but but they're particular to our charter. So we well, our, our charter also has that 1% um, you know, of the, uh, what you might call it, the registered voters. Yep. That's not a standardized thing. So, yep. so there are a few is, is there a, Is there an intent? I mean, I guess it doesn't matter now. Is there an intent to keep that, or is there some thought that there will be charter changes recommended at some point? Um, it crossed my mind, uh, but I, I think the first step is um, that we have that standardized form, and okay. uh, and we don't, you know, require things like notarizing documents when it's, you know, when it's right. not required. Um, but I, I think, you know, one thing that Judy's done is is made it clear, as does the Board of Elections, how many signatures Yellow Springs needs. Mm -hmm. So they do tell you that when you go in. Mm -hmm. um, the problem, again, was their former instruction sheet was paired with the ORC mm -hmm. form, not ours. Um, so it, it didn't make sense. I do, do say one thing. Um, when we had the charter review, I'm working on my memory here, but I think it's correct. Uh, we did have a discussion about that 1% being yes. deviated from what state law required and what, what the county board of elections was doing. The reason why we didn't change that is because that 1% actually requires less signatures to get on the ballot. Mm -hmm. So we felt that that would create it easier for mm -hmm. potential candidates because they wouldn't have to get any signatures. Right. That's right. Our, I assume we'll update the number, the yeah. census. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Well, it's it's actually not the census; it's the qualified the registered voters. So it's actually oh. a different number. Okay. So. And, I mean, Judy, related to that, on the general instructions, are are we proposing to include this list or? The list of general instructions. The five the five items. I, Lynn was going to send their updated instru instructions sheet. Uh -huh. So I think it's, I mean, this is a little <clears throat> bit of a work in progress, but if that instruction sheet uh, goes over these five points, I would take this off. Okay. Just because if that number changes slightly and then is different from their instruction sheet, it's, we just, I think the goal, what you're trying to accomplish here is to eliminate confusion for someone who may be fairly new to this process and eliminate factors that might cause them to back away or feel that they weren't qualified. So it, we're trying to just streamline it as as much as possible. So as soon as I get that instruction sheet from her, then I'll circulate that around okay. so that you can make that decision. Because if I'm not mistaken, number four does not look accurate to me. No, that's correct. That is correct. Uh, really? Yes. I thought you had to have it filed 90 days before. That is no. No, no 30 okay. days prior to the election. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, the other thing I did ask Lynn about was um, <clears throat> yeah, how far municipalities have gone to help with things like this. You know, like, could there be a sample form for people to look at? Um, we can do those sorts of things, uh, but Lynn did emphasize that we want to be careful um, about, uh, you know, not misleading folks. Right. So. Well, I mean, I think part of what happened with the county, my understanding is part of what happened is that, and, and I think this came from the Secretary of State's office, is that, is that they're, they're not allowed to give Sure. information there are certain things that they're not really allowed to tell people right I think if I think if somebody asks them a very pointed question they can answer it but there is just not general information that they can give right. so and, and yeah that is true but a municipality can do more if they want so I mean so it's something to think about but to me I think I think the the biggest thing is streamlining 
our nominating and is petition. This, this is just for council? It council and the mayor. And mayor. Yeah. Council and mayor, and obviously yeah. we don't have any control over school board. Right. Okay. And, and also they will not, you know, whatever form we use, once you hand it through the window and give it to them, and if you think of something, it's too late. <laughs> when mm -hmm. it goes in the window, it's gone. You can't, mm -hmm. and they won't give it back. Right. Yeah, I mean, if you've done something simple, like not sign it or something, they will not right. tell you. Right. They, yeah. Okay, this, I mean, obviously this is a good thing. We want to make it as easy as possible to um, serve, so thanks. Yeah, so then, Judy, are, is the, uh, is the recommend, recommendation on the table to use the, the, the non-partisan form that's on the table? Well, I, I mean, I'm kind of throwing it to council's consideration, but I just think that's the simplest thing. We had yeah. a person who was disqualified simply because he downloaded the ORC form, he assumed he was right. in good standing, kind of doing his own thing, doing his own research. That's a reasonable assumption to be able to make, I would think. And again, you know, our, our process excluded him. And so I think, again, to be inclusive, the more standardized we are, the, the better. But that's just me. So it's that's, that's what I think. So. Yeah, I mean, if you can, I mean, the idea that you could download it and not have to go to the Board of Elections, I think that there is. And so then that would say that then whatever these instructions are that we come up with whatever the county has and, and um, so I mean, that would be somebody something that somebody should do though is make sure they get the correct instructions. So yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Good work. So do we need to do anything? It but sounds like I'll follow it's up in with progress. the instruction sheet and okay. let me get with you about kind of finalizing that. Okay. And is this something that will be a council decision? Will council vote on this? I feel like it's a good idea to put that on the record. I'm mm -hmm. trying to think. Yes. I think it makes sense to me. Okay. So well, if we can do that, you think we can do that before the end of the year? I don't see why not. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, next is House Bill 179 discussion, uh, sanctuary status and implications. We have a lot of uh, information in our packet about this. Um, I assume Chief put some of that together, so we appreciate that. Um, you're here to present to us. Well, um, I've prepared a brief statement, <laughs> and then I'll field questions from you. Um, as mentioned before, uh, Hotel Springs Police Department, we will not question, ID, detain, or arrest anyone solely based on immigration status. Um, I've had some suggestions um, given to me to maybe elaborate on that some, and I'm working on that. But I would like to say I understand how sensitive and important of an issue this is in our community. I am very concerned, though, that the public and extended discussions on this topic may bring too much attention to what is currently a non-issue. So I'm happy to answer any questions for you right now. Um, Brian, I think it might be good if um, you expound just a little bit on um, what, where your concern lies. Um, because um, right now the way that the, um, the ICE laws and immigration laws and that read, um, this isn't something that directly affects our department, correct? Absolutely. We do not enforce uh, federal immigration laws. Um, we s simply uh, do our job as law enforcement officers in the community. Um, I did speak with the sheriff today. Um, they are in the same kind of position as, as we. Um, once someone is detained and in jail, um, that's typically where something may occur. Mm -hmm. um, it's the, the most recent language and things that we could find with the exception of the proposed House Bill 179, I think was 2007 or 8. And um, so again, it's kind of been a non-issue. Mm -hmm. um, okay. 
So, uh, you know, I'll just mention a few things. I mean, you know, the reason why this came on our radar, of course, was because of House Bill 179. I checked this morning. There hasn't been any action on that bill since May of this year, um, which kind of follows with where a lot of these documents came from, which is uh, Jessica Ramos, who uh, is involved in immigration law and, and shared a lot of uh, things that she worked on with, with Dayton which obviously would you know, have more issues. A um, couple things that occur to me, one is uh, if we could get Green County's policy on this, um, because when I read these documents, it seems like a lot of it goes to the county sheriff. Um, so it would just be good to know, I guess, how uh, Yellow Springs is potentially affected by the sheriff's decision, but I think it's good uh, what you've just shared with us, uh, Chief Carlson. Um, and then I appreciate that you're looking at, you know, maybe just beefing up the language a little bit. I know that um, uh, Re uh, Jessica Ramos made some suggestions about some things that we might do. Um, and one thing that popped out to me when I looked at these documents was the service for translation. Um, are, are, are we aware of that? Do our officers know if they had someone that didn't speak? English, yes. uh, who to call, or we do. We are limited to some extent, and that's something that we need to expand as well. Um, and do we have do this? Those have to be official, or can those be citizens? They can be citizens. Okay. And do we have this card that they referred to with the ninety languages? Yes. Okay. Cool. Um, that was that was the only thing to me, you know. So I think if we just maybe. We don't have to have as detailed a policy as, as Dayton, but you know, if we maybe just look at possibly adding a few more mm -hmm. of those I, those things. It, and when you talked <coughs> to the sheriff this morning, I think he said he was going to <coughs> check into the policy and maybe get you a copy or something. Correct. Yeah. So I, if we could have that in the packet, that would just be good for us to understand. Great. Um, but yeah, uh, there was a lot of information in here, mostly because uh, oh, so you, this is all stuff you put. This in the was market? this was all given to us, and, and mostly just because I didn't want to pick and choose what I thought was relevant. So mm -hmm. I just uh, decided to share it all. So Good stuff. all right, thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks, thanks Chief. Thank you. Uh, next is. Um, review of um, leadership training outcomes. Patty. Um, as council knows, in um, late 2016, council hired um, consultant Brenda Craner, she's a professor at Wright State University, to conduct um, leadership and team building training with the village super supervisory staff. And that staff included um, Melissa, Ruth Ann Willick, Judy Kentner, Denise Swinger, Brad Alt, Jason Hamby, Johnny Burns, Chief Carlson, Sergeants Watson and Knapp, and myself. Um, so beginning in October of 2016, I met individually with Brenda one-on-one um, -on -one for a total of uh, 10 times. It was approximately an hour and a half each time. And then in addition, the full supervisory staff met with Brenda in four different sessions for a total of 24 hours. Um, and during this time, we conducted a lot of different exercises that helped us learn um, our own individual methods of communication, how those methods are perceived by um, other people, um, helped us to understand how others can, how and why others communicate and to understand um, how to interpret that in the way that that person means it to be interpreted. Um, it was really an interesting, um, an, an interesting exercise and I, I enjoyed the, the uh, not only the one-on-one -on -one sessions, but the sessions with my staff, I thought were really very good. And um, I, I listed some of the specific activities there that we went through with um, with this training. There was the Strengths Finder workshop, where each of us took individual uh, individual tests that showed our different traits, where our strengths lie, where areas perhaps were not quite as strong that we could work on and improve. Um, model the way and trust. Um, we discovered our own values and how people develop individual values based on different things like their upbringing, their culture, um, their heritage, different things like that. Um, inspire a shared vision and challenge the process. It, it 
my, not that my staff didn't already think outside the box, but this, um, this helped us do that a, a little bit better and a little bit more cohesively, enable others to, and to act and encourage the heart. Everybody likes to do things that they're good at. And if you're passionate about what you do and you enjoy doing it, you're going to do a better job at it. And um, so this kind of helped us learn to focus on our strengths and to form um, working teams with people who maybe have the strengths where we're not quite as strong and we can work together to be a little bit more efficient and productive. Um, and then each session had a homework assignments where um, the participants applied something they had learned in class to the workplace. And those were, I thought those were pretty interesting exercises. Um, so staff came away from the training with an, a, a renewed appreciation for how we communicate in different ways, um, you know, based, based on the things that are in our lives and the things that have influenced us as we've grown up and, and matured and, and gone through our lives. And, we also came away with a few practical things like project flow sheets, which there's a sample in the, uh, in the packet of a project flow sheet. And what we do is we take the project um, idea or title. Uh, for instance, right now one of the things before council is the um, designated smoking areas. So that, that goes on the top line, a brief description is to determine on each public property if there will be a designated smoking area, if so, where that will be. Um, the, it has a lead staff member and also additional staff members who are working on that project. The desired outcome uh, would be that um, each publicly owned property has either a designated smoking area or is specifically signed no smoking because it's too small. And then the action steps and target dates. So um, that would be filled out and then a target completion date, for instance, the target completion date for the smoking limitation is I believe it's coming up next at the next uh, council meeting. So that would be prepared and ready for the next council meeting. Uh, so we came away with uh, those things. We have a uh, staff-wide habit of trying to summarize meetings via email and sending that out to the group so that everybody can read it and comment on the recap to make sure everything has been adequately um, uh, everybody's on the same page and understands things in the same way. Um, we came away with a renewed effort to try to minimize duplication of efforts, um, which ties into the learning where your strengths are and working with someone who has strengths that are not um, the same as yours, but so that you can build upon each other. And uh, <coughs> we also have established a practice of holding immediate supervisory staff meetings when unusual events occur to try to coordinate tasks and make sure everybody's on the same page. Luckily, that doesn't happen too often, but if it does, we're, um, we're ready to go. And the final thing is that Melissa and I are working together on uh, professional development programs. So, Melissa, you were at the training. Judy, you were at the training. Did you want to say anything? Is that? I think you summed it up pretty well. Yeah. So. Does anyone have any questions? Council, audience? Um, with the uh, <coughs> project ID f idea flow sheets, mm -hmm. um, what happens to those? Um, we bring them to staff meetings and update on them. Okay. Do we have one on the uh, utility roundup? We don't have one on the utility roundup, but we can certainly create one and put Melissa's name on it. Okay. So. All right. Any, any other questions? Anyone? No, good job. I, yeah. I, we appreciate the staff, you would staff, the whole staff going through this. It was a lot of time um, and a lot of commitment, but we really appreciate it. And we can obviously see some positive changes and positive developments out of it. So thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, next is manager's report. So you can keep talking. I can keep talking. Um, so, uh, council did see the resolution for the crew quarters tonight, and so we will be letting that contract um, as uh, noted in the resolution, and uh, hopefully get that project um, on the road. The Bryan Center generator, we have a new generator. Um, this is a generator that was bought several years ago that was meant to go into the Bryan Center and then um, at that particular time was not able to be adapted properly. Now it was able, things have 
changed a little bit in the code um, that allowed us to do that. So um, the electric crew made that happen and they took this um, piece of equipment that was essentially still brand new and sitting in its uh, sitting in its crate out at the farm and they got it cleaned up and repurposed it and now this entire building um, has emergency power. Previously it was only the police department that had emergency power which was part of the reason that this building could not be used as a shelter um, to shelter people in emergencies. So now that we have um, enough power to generate for the entire building we can look again at this being a potential uh, center to house people in, in an emergency and uh, which is a positive. I mean it's, uh, it's wonderful that we can look at doing that again. So um, community resources um, as part of the um, the property uh, formerly known as the CBE coming uh, to the village uh, for ownership uh, community <coughs> resources uh, had, to had decided to resolve so they transferred that property to the village and part of the agreement was that once everything was said and done, anything that was left in that account would also come back to the village. That was finally done and closed out um, last week, I think, and so we did get a check from Community Resources for $22,185.50. And that's the last piece of the puzzle. I turned that over to Melissa. Um, I'm not sure what line she put. Did you just put it in general fund? Mm -hmm. So that went into the general fund. And uh, that, uh, that piece of that uh, book is, is finally closed. And why did we decide to put it in the general fund? Um, that was, I, I couldn't um, really justify putting it anywhere else necessarily, so it just went into the general fund and if council has other ideas for it, it could always be moved. Well, what about the economic development fund? It could be. Because that's, that's where it originally came from. Um, Not really, no. but no, no, because the money from the economic development revolving loan fund um, went to purchase the property. So that is that is other grant funding that they've received. Mm. Okay. I don't, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you that it's not a bad place. I, I would, I'm guessing that Melissa's of a mind that that fund is set, has been sitting there and not being used. So it could probably be transferred in at some other, mm -hmm. at some point in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, I, I, I would agree with you generally about that. Um, that certainly it seems like the, that money should be used to market the property um, or do improvements to the property, whatever needs to be done next. Um, yard waste, a reminder that November is the last month that Rumpke will pick up yard waste on the last Friday of the month. So uh, this Friday, actually, is the last day to put yard waste out in the Rumpke bags that are available in the utility office. Um, please do not put them in other uh, bags from someplace else because Rumpke will not pick them up. Um, it's part of the contract that I wasn't able to take and talk them out of. So if you have yard waste that you would like to have picked up by, fr uh, by Rumpke and recycled as yard waste composted, then please get your bags from the utility office and have them out this Friday for pickup. This is the last Friday. And they will come on Friday, even though it's the day after Thanksgiving? Mm -hmm. Okay. The hardware store sells them also. Oh, oh. I, thank you. Thank you. Um, council see, can see in the packet I put in the annual wage adjustment uh, uh, survey that we did in the surrounding areas. Uh, unfortunately, I did not get answers to two of them. Uh, normally there are eight. I did not get answers from two of them. Two of them are still in negotiations, but you can see the results of the other four surrounding areas and the wage increase that they're giving to their staff this year um, based on <coughs> excuse me, based on a review of this information, um, Melissa and I recommend a two and a half percent wage adjustment for hourly employees. And if council is of a mind to do that, then we can bring that legislation and that would be effective um, January 1. Okay. Or whichever pay period is immediately following mm -hmm. January 1. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, we will bring that to the next meeting. Uh, so up to upcoming topics, um, we will be bringing at some point when um, four staff members have an opportunity to sit down and talk, um, the state legislature passed a bill governing small cellular towers 
in public right of ways. And the bill essentially limits our rights as a municipality. And there are some areas that we can control and there are some areas that we cannot control. And we, they literally took away our right to control. So we are um, looking at other legislation that other municipalities have passed. Um, I have been working with Chris, Denise, and Johnny because Johnny is the one that handles all the electric poles in, in the village. Um, so we've been working together to try to come up with a, a piece of legislation for the village that will help us to um, control this as much as we can under this bill. And at some point in the near future, this will be coming before council as a piece of legislation. Um, we've also been reviewing the um, special event and Bryan Center rental process. Um, Ruth Ann and Samantha Stewart, who is our uh, coordinator of Parks and Recreation, have been working on that together to revamp uh, the event form as well as the process for submissions and how it's shepherded through staff to make sure people get what they need at their events. And so we will be bringing that updated, um, that updated information to council in the future. Um, we also are talking about things like possibly having permanent facilities for such events where there's, <coughs> excuse me, easily accessible electric and possibly restrooms. Um, so we will be uh, bringing some of that information. I actually got some information on um, prefabricated public restrooms at uh, the ICMA conference and, and it's really interesting that they have them and you just drop them in on a slab and hook your utilities up and um, you're ready to go. So um, sometime in the, the near future we'll be bringing those topics back to council for discussion. Can I ask about with the um, cell tower thing? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so what kind of permit fee, application fee, can we put on those? Well, actually, that's one of the things that's not limited, Brian. Nice. So um, that is something that we're discussing. I know that one of the sample legislations we looked at had 200, 250-something like that on the fee. Uh, I mean, no. so we could make it 10,000 or whatever? <laughs> I think we would probably get dinged on 10,000. I like your thought process, but I think we would probably get dinged on that. But um, it, it can be substantially higher than what our regular rate structure is for something like this. Okay. But it's not, it's not a revenue. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm thinking more of a preventative measure. So. And, and the, this, is, this is on cell towers it's, specifically, it's, right? It's on small cell towers and, right. and small cell towers can be either freestanding or they can be a smaller unit that attaches to an existing pole um, and they're essentially and Chris you can correct me if I'm wrong on this but essentially the legislation says we can't turn anybody down uh -huh. um, uh, we they have to provide us with alternate sites um, but we can't turn anybody down, and um, they can pretty much put it wherever they want. Correct, okay. Chris? I'm, I'm public property, we're talking? I'm sorry? We're talking about on public property, right? In the rights of way, yes. Right, anyway, okay. Yes, the, uh, the, there are some legal challenges uh, that have been initiated by a number of communities against the uh, the legislation. There's a couple different constitutional arguments um, so far on the rulings that I'm aware of. One is for municipalities, one is against. Uh, I'm being told that there's some negotiations going on in the legislature, uh, perhaps revisit the language in the uh, legislation, uh, but that still hasn't been done. Uh, the municipalities' biggest complaints start with one, uh, it's our it's the municipality's property. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't be required to just give it away. They shouldn't be able to lease it. Um, instead of the uh, this legislation which says there's a one-time fee, uh, essentially it can be put wherever the, uh, the provider wants to put it. And um, <coughs> the best that a community can hope to do is put in some aesthetic standards. So, I mean, imagine if a company wanted to come in and put a mini cell tower in, uh, a historic district mm -hmm. uh, or your, your commercial district and uh, it wasn't really compatible with the aesthetics so um, 
the, uh, the various municipal agencies, a lot of municipal attorneys associations, the organizations that Patty's belong, belongs to, have all um, put forth, they can't put forth some stuff to, some things to address those issues in a, in a broad sense. Uh, Cincinnati and Cleveland were the first communities to write some comprehensive legislation that they passed a while ago. Um, and we're just trying to tailor something that fits Yellow Springs because it's just, you know, every community is a little different. What's the rationale behind this? Uh, strong lobbying. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think that that's the general consensus. And I'm guessing that it's it's a communications issue, that, yeah. that they're saying it's open communications, that mm -hmm. you need, they need to provide accessible communications. I, yeah, and I, I think it's fair. Well, there is a strong lobbying group. I think that there, one aspect of it is that it's, that it's the difference between, okay, a large cell tower provides you with this broad base of coverage, but you can't put large cell towers everywhere. Uh, and so the mini cell towers would then pick up these gaps that all of us experienced and how frustrating that is. Um, I think that most people would agree that there needs to be some way to, to, to bridge the gap, as it were, but I think that the loss of local control is what's been most troubling to uh, mm -hmm. municipalities. Sure. But I am assuming that these, so these are going on existing polls. Some of them are Not going, necessarily. some of them are going on existing polls and some of them are going on their own polls that are then erected in the right of way and the, the small towers attached to the top. Okay. And there's some that I found from what we've seen is they're on the ground. They're on, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the okay. ideal world, you find a roof to put it on, put it behind a facade of some kind, and because they're not all. And, but I assume they're they are. Property are they property talking property. to private property owners too? I mean, is this? I, I would. I don't know. They may yeah. be, but I'm not sure that they would, because a private property owner can extract more money from them or private lease than when a municipality has to give it away for free. Right. Mm -hmm. And and and. We, we there has been some interest from <coughs> companies that want to put small cell towers in the village in the right <coughs> way. So we do need to get this legislation written so that we have um, something that we can say here are the conditions. Okay. Well, I I am interested in in knowing what's the f most restrictive we can be. So in terms of that, you know, permit fee and everything. I mean, the last cell tower we put in didn't even benefit the village, so. Right. Okay. Thanks. And that's all I have. Okay. Melissa? Okay. Um, lodging tax information. Um, I know that this is a discussion point at the next meeting, but I thought that I would um, just put out there that I've been working really hard on um, getting documents um, created and put online and um, I've got a whole page uh, dedicated to lodging tax and I also have the permit application that can be submitted online which I'm really excited about um, so we have tested that and it seems to be working but um, I think that one was submitted just this evening so um, I will ask Denise tomorrow to check that out and make sure that it works so um, I will be open to suggestions, so if everybody could check that out, and um, we can discuss that more in detail at the next meeting. Um, some future, uh, two pieces of future legislation that will have to come um, in uh, meeting, upcoming meetings. Uh, the first one is House Bill 49 legislation. Um, this is basically, um, House Bill 49 was passed early in 2017 and it had a number of different income tax changes and it, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's been a while since this has been discussed, but um, the, the, change that, the changes that need to happen um, and passed by us before January 31st of 2018 are just definition and due date changes. So um, I will have more information on that in the next uh, packet um, when it will be presented. I think it's on the, yes, it's on the next uh, meeting. So I will have some more information um, that's been put out by uh, the Regional Income Tax Authority that takes care of our income taxes for us. They prepared uh, the legislation um, for us so that it uh, meets all the requirements. So that will be upcoming. Um, the next item will be some utility dispute resolution board changes. Um, we had a we had to convene the board um, a week or two ago. And um, the board kind of discussed um, some procedural changes or some, we discussed some procedures that aren't necessarily spelled out. So we will have um, some legislation come before council 
just to outline and make clear some uh, <coughs> changes in procedure. Actually, they're not really changes, they're just outlines of procedure that did not previously exist, just so everybody's clear. Well, so while we're talking about that, um, it had come up that we need to have that tax board as mm -hmm. well. <laughs> Is, are we gonna then make this board both, or what's the? Um, I know that we were wanting to do that. I, I wasn't, I know that Patty was working on that, and I think that she had uh, Chris involved and Judy as well, so I'm not really sure where that landed and if we're there yet, so. Um, I believe we're going to do that, correct? Well, we'll, have, we'll need two different boards, but they will be staffed by the same people. Correct, and um, or that's what we're proposing. And that's likely. That's likely how it will come out. Okay. And at the same time, when we do that, um, the proposal is going to be to actually uh, change the way the board is set up because right now the board consists of Melissa as the finance manager, Johnny as the electric superintendent, myself, and two citizens. And I do not like that. Uh, that composition. I think it should be the finance manager, the electric superintendent, and three citizens. Mm -hmm. um, I should not be on that board because generally um, that has already come to me for a decision before it's appealed to them and um, I just think it's better to have three citizens on that board than three staff members. So we'll be making that composition or proposing to make that composition change at the same time. Okay. And can you remind me, I, I remember that we had to have that board, but what, what, where did it come up? What was it related to? Well, it's Utility but, Dispute Resolution Board. We also created a, uh, an appeal board for the lodging. It's for the lodging tax. Okay. Right. Thank you. Right. So, is that it? Okay. Um, the utility billing software uh, conversion, I have chose to delay it. There were still some bugs that um, I was uncomfortable with moving forward and going live with, so I asked the company to kind of pump the brakes on that because I want to make sure that it's absolutely perfect before it goes live. Um, and then the last thing for me are sidewalk projects. Um, Xenia Avenue sidewalk project, um, in my report it said it was nearly finished, but it is finished. Um, so that was the uh, CDBG grant through Greene County. Um, Safe Routes to School is still ongoing. Um, I think that they have most of the concrete down. Um, I know that a lot of uh, residents have been concerned because of gaps between the concrete and, um, and the dirt, um, but none of that has been graded out yet. So a lot of the drainage and the, the grading and everything is yet to be completed. Um, and I did note, as everybody else has been well aware, we've had a very, very wet fall. So. Um, everything is still moving ahead quite nicely, uh, even as a result of all that wet weather that we've had. So, yeah, it was really cool to walk on. I've got to say, um, the extension up to Stafford. When does that happen? Um, with the kind of transition of staff that we've had, I can't give you a definite answer on that unless Patty has a better <coughs> idea. But I know that it, it was in process, getting uh, different quotes and things, and I'm not sure if. Okay. A uh, contractor was selected. A uh, contractor has not been selected on that yet. I think Jason had two of the three quotes that had been returned to him. So I have to see if, if a third quote had come in yet. Because that's we just like get a that done. I mean, we we're we're nearing the point of no return. Right. We we will. I mean, the only thing I can say is we'll do our best to get it done. And if we don't get it done this fall, we'll get it done in the spring because we have committed <coughs> to doing that. Will there be a dangerous transitional situation? That'll have to be mitigated. Um, I don't think so because it will just be turn, it will just stop and turn into grass <coughs> at that okay. point. Um, and then, but um, I, I know that Jason had two of the two of the quotes and was waiting on a third. I just don't know if that came in. Um, and I know that that Johnny was checking his emails today, um, so I'll ask him. If, and can the contractor just continue? Did you get a quote from the <coughs> contractor who did? I Fair believe field? he was one of the, he was one, and then Chris Durst was one, the one that was doing the ramps on Xenia was okay. the second one, and he had asked for a third one, so. Okay. And that's it for me. Thank you. Chief? Why I brought this paperwork <laughs> up here. 
Uh, we are pleased to announce that we are announcing that we're pleased. <laughs> um, we are uh, in the process, as you know, of our promotion for corporal positions. We are also hiring two full-time officers. Those applications, uh, that will end December 1st. We'll be doing the preliminary testing December 16th. And we've uh, had a good turnout of applicants come through the department. Um, a reminder for everyone, Jerry touched on how it is getting darker earlier. Uh, please, if you can remember, turn on your porch lights a little earlier. Also check your uh, addresses on your homes, even though we do have Google, all it tells us is your destination is on the right. <laughs> Any questions? Um, actually, I, I had mentioned this to uh, um, a while back, but on the activity report under B, can we change that to village policing instead of community policing, mm -hmm. just so that's in line with our um, guidelines? And again, I appreciate that we're uh, including that in the reports. Thanks, Chief. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Judy? Just that it's been super busy. We've had a lot of uh, records requests. Lots of meetings, lots of minutes. Um, orientation has now been set for, for new council members. That'll take place all day on December 7th and the morning of December 8th. And village staff are certainly looking forward to getting to know new council folks. Mm -hmm. um, any ordinances which occur before the end of the year are going to have to be read unless they're then they'll start at the next meeting. But anything that has to come to December 18th will be read as an emergency because otherwise you have to change the title and then you have to start all over again. So if you see a lot of emergencies happening on December 18th, don't be alarmed. That's about it. Thank you. Patty, you have a couple other things? I do. Um, the flour and sugar deliveries were today. Um, so if for some reason you should have gotten flour and sugar and you did not get flour and sugar, please call Ruth Ann at my office at 767-3402 and let her know that and we will make sure that that gets delivered. Um, and also, uh, I forgot to announce that I am on vacation again next week and Melissa will be here and she will be handling anything. So if anyone needs anything, please contact Melissa um, down in the finance office. Can we get a quick update on the, uh, the coats too? Because I know that happened. The coat, oh, the coat shopping? I'll tell you what. Um, I love doing the coat shopping with the kids. Um, it is just so much fun. Uh, we had, uh, what, 24 kids this year, Chief, mm -hmm. and there were um, six of us, and so each of us had three children, and uh, it, I just, it was great. We went to Giovanni's for lunch with them, and uh, then we went and got the shoes and the coat, hat, and gloves, um, and surprisingly, Sears does not sell scarves anymore, uh, winter scarves. They they did, but we found that one individual had taken them and stuffed them in a, oh. um, one of the ovens. So we, we, we don't know if someone was planning on oh. taking them, but uh. so um, but anyway, we had a we had a great time. We had a great time with the kids, and uh, I was uh, I, I I felt really good because I got I got requested by one of the children that I had been with uh, a couple of years ago and he is the sweetest little guy and uh, it was just great and I'm going I'm getting on the bus and he goes Miss Bates I'm with you and I'm like okay because he knew you would let him get those high tops right he, actually he didn't get high tops he did not get high tops well I do want to pass along uh, Principal Housh uh, noted that he was very impressed that village staff spent that amount of time um, to, to do this and he just thought it was great that uh, that the village you know takes the time and makes the effort to uh, to support those kids so yeah. thank you um, it, I, I, speaking for myself, and I'm pretty sure I'm speaking for the other staff members that went, it was our pleasure. I mean, it's just such a great thing, and it's so much fun. And uh, we, had a, we had a couple of new people this year who hadn't gone before, and it, it was uh, pretty interesting for them. And, but everybody had a really good time, and I think the kids were, were pretty happy at the end of the day. That's great. Cool. That's kind of a reminder that um, I believe that the Giving Tree at the library is mm -hmm. was set up today so somebody wants to give uh pick one of the 
pieces of paper off the tree and give a gift to somebody, that would be great. Um, we'll do a brief board and commission report since most of our most of the reports are from members who are gone. Um, Jerry, I know you had a very productive planning commission meeting. Uh, yes, and it was noted in um, Denise's report. Uh, Could you just give just a brief review of uh, the two projects? Yeah, brief. Uh, let's see. Uh, Number one, we uh, had the fire department come come forth and uh, made their presentation uh, to planning commission. Uh, their uh, application was approved with with conditions, and uh, and and I have to commend Matt because uh, you know we we talk about the community being walkable and. Uh, with uh, the fire department, we asked for um, bike ramps as, as part of their condition. Uh, the second one was Cresco's. That was kind of interesting also in the fact of how they had to design their building to fit in, fit into the, uh, their space. Uh, we approved those with, again, uh, bike rack, and and also we we specified that the fence would be black, so there'd be no confusion as as to the uh, to the fence. And let's see, who was the third one, Jude? Was it the third? It seemed that like we had three. No, you did. Well, there was a site plan review, but then there was also the replat. That the replat, Nebraska, and, so. right? Yeah, Those and and we did approve the 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 replat for um, Dayton Street, so that. Uh, the uh, road would be built to our specifications based upon the engineer. There was a, a, a one area we then uh, look at that had to do with drainage, if, and uh, so the drainage issue should, should not be an issue while we're out out there. So, okay. It was Brian? was anticipated to be a long meeting, but it, it was went, very it, quick went, it, it, it it was intense, but it was quick, and 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 all three of the applicants were able to answer the planning commission's concerns. Yeah. So that's good. Well, Jerry, I think I've got in front of you if you well, while well, you're recording. Well, yeah. I'm, can I do, must do that one? Yeah. Go ahead. And do that. Okay. Now, next one is is a library. Uh, we, we have seven possible seats to fill uh, and we're filling them five. I have five nominations for you. Uh, the first one is uh, Joseph Carr, uh, a young gentleman, uh, one of the, the few younger uh, folks that we're, we're now getting to uh, want to serve on, a, on our commissions and so forth. So, And we were very pleased. He's an active user of the library. Uh, and uh, he has, if, if I'm correct, he has some degree, degrees in library studies and so forth. His family uses the library. They love the reading program. So we're recommending him for one of the positions. The next person that we're recommending is uh, Rebecca Eshelman. Eshelman. Mm -hmm. Eshelman. Uh, Rebecca has been on the library committee, the library uh, board for for 12 years. Uh, she's currently active in uh, as a special consultant to the current uh, library uh, Yellow Springs Library Association. Excuse me, and um, she. Uh, well, uh, and she, hers is a reappointment. So. It wasn't okay. Next one is uh, Dorothy Smith, and uh, she is a heavy user of the library, particularly ours. She believes in and strongly in the importance and the uh, centrality of library to the community. Uh, she's retired. She spent 30 plus years working in libraries uh, as a uh, 
archivist at uh, Rice State University and also uh, Hebrew uh, Union College in uh, Cincinnati. The next one is Richard Zoff. Uh, Richard <laughs> has, has been with us for years, but, but what he brings and continually brings is his, he, he, he's kind of the hands-on guy that gets dirty mm -hmm. and, uh, and he helps the rest of the commission to uh, look at what's practical. And, and take the goodies off, and uh, so and he uh, is, uh, and he knows the building. He knows the building real well, Very much and, so. and we we feel that uh, yeah, we want to definitely retain someone that has some history on the on the village, on the on the building. Excuse me. Then we have uh, Leanne Duncan. Uh, her experience is, is, well, number one, 20 years as a citizen of the village. Uh, she formerly had served on the Library Commission, uh, 23 years working in both public and academic libraries. And uh, she has also been on the Library Commission for seven years. So those are the five that I want to uh, nominate at this point. And can I just ask Jerry, are those all um, full members or? Yeah, okay. all, yeah, all, yeah. all full, full members. Okay. Uh, second? Uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Looks like a good crew. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Jerry. Mm -hmm. uh, Brian? Uh, yeah, so um, first of all, with the Arts and Culture Commission, I just wanted to um, get a save the date out there for January 19th from 6 to 9 p.m. This is going to be the official reopening of the Bryan Center Gallery and uh, Bryan Center Community Gallery, I should say. And um, I believe the, uh, the focus of the show is going to be on the banners that used to hang around town. Um, and when we changed the poles, the, the size of the banners changed. Um, and uh, related to that, Patty, uh, I know the Arts Council is, is starting to look at um, storing the art in the room that we found. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess if we can find a new home for that island, huge piece that I guess is in there now. There's not enough room for them to still do that? I, they thought maybe it, there wouldn't be. So I don't know if we can find another place for it. but. I'm not sure, but I'll look at it. Okay. Um, and then uh, with the, uh, well, and I guess one other thing is uh, the Arts and Culture Commission is looking at supporting a uh, project uh, for Mills Lawn that's relating, related to uh, uh, Willing Gaunt. And it's uh, also involving creating a book that uh, highlights our African American elders in town. So uh, it looks like a really cool project. Mm -hmm. And we're also going to be submitting something um, for some of the equipment that we need for the gallery, um, which will, you know, be part of the budget that council already approved. Um, and then with the Economic Sustainability Commission, um, I guess the main thing is. We want to try to sort of wrap up the revolving loan fund uh, piece that we brought to council a couple meetings ago. And so, Melissa, I know you've been busy, and Chris as well, but I, I think the, maybe the last piece was kind of in your guys' court um, related to the legal parts and then also what was going to happen with um, the uh, credit union. So. I don't know if it's possible to get that together before the end of the year, but that would be nice. And that's all I have. Okay. Um, Green County Regional Planning Commission. Um, past couple meetings, we really haven't done uh, much in terms of subdivisions or anything else. Um, we've been working on the budget um, for Green County Regional Planning, and it's looking like um, Ken LeBlanc will be retiring sometime <laughs> in 2018, um, and there will be um, looking for a replacement for him. And there is a meeting tomorrow night here in the Bryan Center 
um, Green County Transportation Plan um, at 6.30, 6 o'clock. Uh, I don't want to look. 6.30 sounds right. I think 6.30, right. yeah. Um, Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission. Um, the last meeting, it was actually probably the most contentious one I've seen. Um, it was, um, there's Brian Martin, who's the, who's the director, um, presented a plan for widening the section of, two, of Route 35 from where it's three lanes in Dayton to 675, so that it's, it's probably about a mile stretch, maybe a mile and a half stretch, where it's two, two lane, lanes, yeah. and it is bumper to bumper well, in the mornings well, and in the yeah. evenings. It's been, on the, it's been on the project list for about 30 or 40 years. It needs to get done. Um, and so there was a funding proposal presented that, that almost the, whole, the entire board um, supported. Um, there was ex concern expressed from Greene County because of the concern that all of that, that three lanes of traffic is basically going to then funnel down to the two lanes in at 675 going into Greene County, except for the fact that probably at least half of that traffic is off. exiting off 675. Right. Right. So it's a little bit of, you know, 35, the 35 project, the Green, 35 Green project is on the books. It's going to get done. It's going to be the, it's going to be the um, super street, but it shouldn't stop or prioritize, be, be prioritized over this project. That's my opinion and that's the opinion of everybody else that was there except Commissioner um, Glazer. Yes, of course. Um, oh, by the way, and it's 6 p.m. tomorrow is the third. 6 p.m., okay. Yeah. Uh, so that was really all with uh, Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission. The Chamber, um, I can announce our uh, new board members. Incoming board members um, are, include Minerva Bieri, Bieri, um, Sarah Courtright, Jerry Deere, and Dave Amon. Um, and outgoing board members as of uh, the first of the year, Craig Meesher, Sheila dunphy Pilata, Molly Lundy, uh, Randy Gifford, and Bruce Grimes. Um, almost all of those, all except Bruce. Bruce served three years and, and the other four served six years, which is the maximum um, in a row. Um, and two things I should have mentioned um, when I was doing announcements. Uh, first, um, we are doing a decorating contest for downtown, but we'd like to extend that to the rest of town um, for folks to put out some lights. And last year, if you recall, um, with the hotel, was completely lit up. Um, we actually lit the tree across the street in the, in the uh, lawn of the funeral home, and we're actually going to be doing that again tomorrow night. So we would really like to see it. And I want to thank uh, Johnny Burns and the electrical, Electric Department for getting up our candy cane um, lights on the, on the light poles and the banners on the, on the light poles also. So we need to get some more lights and decorations up. So, and, I, and I do believe that the Arts and Culture Commission are going to be, or they're going to be judging um, the, the decorating contest. Mm -hmm. And what time is the tree lighting? The tree lighting is at 6 o'clock and there will be hot cocoa from Dino's Coffee and there will be um, pretzel bites from Brazil. Is it? Is that what it's called, yeah. Bezel? Okay. So, six, food and drink. Six. Okay. Six o'clock. Okay. Yeah, two things at six o'clock. So mm. I can only do one. Are, are, are you, you guys encouraging people to walk to it? Sure. And wear your light. <laughs> Decorate. Right. Wear your Christmas lights. That's right. Red and green. <laughs> um, so future agenda items. Um, I have a feeling the next two meetings are going to be very full. Um, so, Melissa, we've got the ordinance in response to House Bill 49, um, and I know what utility dispute resolution board procedures, wage increase, so we've got um, JSTF report on taser policy. I mean, I guess we're going to have the, um, are we going to have a further report on the study, on the survey? The well. Judith's letter did say the first meeting in December, so... Okay, well, let's put that on there. Well, what are we calling it? What is this? Citations and warnings report? You know, at the last, the last time that you had two of them on, Marianne brought up this 
the notion that you had decided not to have two kinds of reports at a time from right. a from a commission. Just I'm just throwing that out there. You, right. you could bump let's, one forward. Um, let's we let's put them both on, um, and maybe I, I guess. I feel like we knew, do need to have that citations and warning report simply because yes. it's it's been a priority. Um, the taser policy, I am not sure. I think maybe let's move that one to December 18th. Okay. So the, the taser policy will be December 18th. So we'll continue the board and commission discussion. We also will have a presentation and information on the lodging tax implementation, outreach specialist um, funding and job description discuss, discussion, um, complete streets policy, that's something that you're bringing, Brian. Mm -hmm. um, and we are starting um, the meeting at 5.30. From 5.30 to 7, we will have an executive session um, we will be reviewing our village manager. So um, what time do you want me to be here? At 5.30 or at 6? Probably 6 would work. Mm -hmm. And um, also um, two things. Um, Johnny Burns would like to come and uh, speak briefly about uh, possibly buying a valve exercise machine out of the contingency fund for the water plant because it is part of what the EPA is asking us to do mm -hmm. um, with our new water plant. And so he has some information on the machines and a couple of quotes, and he would like to come and talk to council about that. And then uh, Brian, I think, would like to do a celebration of or acknowledgement of the three civilians that intervened uh, downtown a couple of weeks ago when a, a woman was uh, attacked. Mm -hmm. And so Brian would like to do an acknowledgement of that. So we'll do that in the beginning, Brian. That's First 18th. thing. Hmm. On December 4th. 4th. Okay. Is that OK? Yes. OK. That's the beginning. Yes. And did you want nominating petition information to come? I can just throw that into the clerk. I, I've, got that. I've got that. I've got that at the got last it. one. Okay. Um, because it seems to me, from what I've heard, you know, it seems that we could do the legislation. What kind is it? Is it a re going to be a resolution or an ordinance? So it'll be a resolution. The nominating, nominating, petition. nominating petition. I don't know. What do you think? The charter doesn't say anything about the particular form that's used. So I would lean towards a resolution. Yeah. So I would lean towards a resolution right now. So I would say, since we've talked about it, I would say that we can do that at the last meeting. I mean, we already just really filled this meeting up, so I don't think I don't want to try to do it on the fourth um, because there are some meaty subjects there. Yeah. So we'll have a supplemental. We may very well have. Um, amending fee schedule for transient and guest lodging permits. We may very well have other legislation um, as we finish up the end of the year. Designated smoking areas and signage, the nominating petition that we just added, and Bowen is coming off of the agenda. They had, had a communication. Well, they haven't responded quite yet, though, if well, they want to come off of that agenda or and go to the January 2nd agenda or not. I sent that to them, asking them if that was uh, an acceptable move for them and they haven't responded back with the schedule yet so well I, I'm expecting that they're going to I and I would too but um, they just felt like they needed a little bit more time to prepare well and there, it, maybe that makes sense too right um, now it's I, I think it's I think it's probably good so you, you said so it's a January 2nd meeting mm-hmm okay yeah. um, and then um, can we for the the 18th, can we also put the revolving loan fund as a if we can get that together? But as actual legislation. Uh. I mean, if we're talking the legislation, you're, it's going to have to be on the December 4th because council hasn't even been. Okay. And I, I'm assuming it might have to be a or an ordinance and not a resolution. Yeah, and I, it's I will tell you that, that really need to look at whether or not we can partner with the credit union to be discussed. 
Okay. Um, let's, let's tentatively put it on the agenda, and, and you know maybe it's something that just needs to wait. I know Brian was hoping to get it done, and I was hoping to get it done while I was still on council, but that just may not happen. Okay. Okay. I think we're done. Um, well, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. aye.